Praise the Lord. I know we can do better than that. Praise the Lord. I don't know about you, but I know he's done something for me just in this past week. How about you? Has God done, has he done just one thing for you that you can shout about this morning? That you can give him a clap of praise? Bless the Lord. He is so good. Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I have ever done. So thank you for that, Fernanda. Thank you. If you please stand, this is our uh, time to uh, call to worship. I'll be coming from Psalm 100. And this is what the word of the Lord says. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his, we are the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into these gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. And his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Praise God. It is now time for our praise and worship. Amen. Sing one. <laughs>
up this morning, started me on my way. Give him the glory, give him the praise. He didn't have to wake us up this morning, did he? But he did. God, God, just thank you, Lord. Thank you. Let us pray. Father, we come this morning just so grateful, Father God, that we're able to gather one more time in your name, Father God. What a blessing it is to come together and to worship you, Father God. We hunger and we thirst for you, O Lord. So we ask you to fill this place, Father God, with your spirit. Move in here like a mighty rushing wind, O God, that lives might be saved and souls might be changed, Father God. God, we just thank you for how you have kept us another week. There are some that didn't make it to this place, that didn't make it through the week, Father God. And we're grateful that we're here. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor, Father God, because you didn't have to. We're grateful, Father God, that, that you're just um, in our midst constantly, Father God. You say that you dwell within us, Father. That, that the, the moment we accept Christ, the Spirit of God dwells inside of us to guide us and to lead us, Father God, in the ways that we should go. So, Father, we are grateful for how you love us and comfort us and protect us and provide for us each and every day, Father God. Lord, we just ask you to have your way in this place this morning. It is not about us, Father God, but all about you. May every word that is uttered, every song that is sung, Father God, glorify your name, Father God. We pray for the preacher, our pastor this morning, that you might send a full anointing, Father God. Pour it fresh, Father God. Fill him up so full that he will overflow, Father God, and be able to you know, pour it out upon us, Father. Have your way, O oh God. Have your way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our congregational hymn. I'm on the battlefield. I'm on the battlefield.
seated. Bless the Lord. And it's that time of service when we welcome not only those that are always here every Sunday, but those who are visiting. And this Sunday, we welcome those who have come home. And so if there's anyone that is a first-time visitor here this morning, if you would just kind of raise your hand or stand to let us know that you're here. First-time visitors? Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. And I know that there's some of you that have come home, so I'd like you to kind of put your hands up or stand up as well to let us know that you have come home. Uh-oh, we got shy. There you are. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. I know there's more out there. <laughs> Praise God. But welcome this morning. And those online also who are, are, are visiting or have uh, come back just to be here for the day, we, we welcome you as well. Uh, we want you to know that we love the Lord here. Amen. We love the Lord. We love the Word of God. We love each other, and we love our pastor. Okay, so we, we love to worship. So we invite you to join us this morning as we, as we worship the Lord this morning in the beauty of holiness, okay? It's anything hindering you, set it down. Set it down. Just enjoy the hour. Get rid of that stress and that anxiety, all of that stuff that has just kept you wound up all week. Just let it go. And for one hour at least, just let the Lord worship uh, speak to you, all right? Let him calm your spirit and put you at peace. But we welcome you here this morning, and we thank you for coming, and we hope that you come again. <clears throat> Praise God. It is now time for our announcements and our giving statement and offertory prayer by our deacons. The homecoming 2024 celebration is here. We invite you to stay following the morning worship to enjoy the homecoming meal, the Christian comedian, and the 2 p.m. afternoon service with our guests from Bethlehem Baptist Church. Following homecoming, there are three nights of fall revival. The theme is, We've Come This Far by Faith. Three different guest preachers will bless us each night. Reverend Dr. Tyrone Jones IV from Columbia, Maryland, Bishop Lisa Wea from Baltimore, Maryland, and Reverend Dr. Vernon Walton from Vienna, Virginia. Please plan to be here and look forward to being blessed. <coughs> Clergy Appreciation Month is here. October is set aside to shower our clergy with an abundance of encouragement, well wishes, and love. Boxes have been placed in the foyer at the top of the stairs so that you may leave your cards, letters, notes, and other expressions of love. The boxes will remain there until October 27th. In addition to the boxes, expressions can be mailed to the church with the minister's name on them or dropped off at the church office. The choir rehearsal dates are as follows for the combined choir, October 3rd, 10th, 17th, and 29th at 7 p.m. For the men's choir, September 30th, October 8th, and 28th at 7 p.m. For the youth choir, rehearsal dates are October 17th and 24th at 6 p.m. Please note there is no rehearsal on Thursday, October 31st. The quarterly church meeting will be held on Thursday, October 24th at 7.30 p.m. Please note at the meeting there will be two constitutional amendments to vote on. Those amendments will be made known to you through the membership broadcast or printed copies. The nominating working group is informing the church body that there is currently one vacancy for church leadership position, that is, the assistant treasurer. Terms of several other positions will expire December 31st. They are three trustee positions, a communications ministry lead, 
and one nominating working group member. If you have a heart to serve, please contact a member of the nominating working group. Job descriptions can be received from a member of the group or from the church secretary. Save the date. Shiloh News Site will hold a deacon ordination service on Saturday, November 16 at 11 a.m. Shiloh will ordain Angela Coleman, David Walden, and Ella Wyatt as deacons of this church. The Fedrick's Alzheimer's Walk 2024 will be held on Saturday, November 2nd at 10 a.m. at the Virginia Credit Union Stadium. It is free to walk, but you must register. Shiloh has a team, team captain, Deacon Marquesa Jai. You may sign up to walk with our team or donate at alz.org slash walk. Our social justice ministry reminds us that early voting begins on September 20th for the November 5th election day. This is not the time to be complacent. Every person that can vote needs to register to vote and go vote. Your tithes and offerings can be given on the church's website, the black offering boxes in the foyer, or placing it in the offertory plate as you exit. For your convenience, slides of the announcements are available on the church's website. As always, thank you for your attention. Good morning, Shalom. Good morning. We want, want to take this time to thank you for your tithes and your gifts, and they are used to, for benevolence, to help with outreach here, and outreach outside of Shallow. So we want to thank you for that. And we want to also thank you for your, uh, your spiritual gifts so that we uh, can be welcome here when we come on Sunday mornings and all through the week for all those that uh, give us of their time and their talents. So let's take this time to go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the tithes and offerings that you have presented before us. And we ask that you bless those who gave and that you will uplift those who have not and are not able to give, Lord, so that they too can be a blessing to you. We thank you for this precious day that you have provided, Lord, and we just want to say thank you for each and everything you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
word says, come to me, ye who are tired and weary, and I will give you rest. See, we carry an awful heavy sack with us around sometimes. Uh, the burdens of life just weigh us down, and he's asking us just to let him go, set him at the foot of the cross, and he'll take your, he'll take your burden, and you can take his, which is lighter. So do that this morning as we come to him. Let us pray. Father, we come just giving you all the glory and the honor, Father God, for you are truly worthy to be praised. And God, we thank you that you are concerned about the things that we are concerned about. Father God, there's not a thing in our minds and hearts that you don't already know about, Father God. You don't know, you know all the things that we're thinking about. You know all the things that we're suffering with, Father God. You know all the things we're struggling with. So, Father God, I pray right now that there'll be a release, Father God, that someone will release all of that right now in the name of Jesus. They'll let it go, Father God. They'll give it to you and to let you, Father God, care for it and, and take care of it, Father God. Help them to understand that there's not a thing they can do without you, that they need you, Father God, that you are their their life's sustainment. So God, I just ask you to just help us this morning. Help us to trust you more. To trust that you'll do what you say you're going to do, Father God. It may not be when we want it to be, Father God, but it's going to be right at that moment when it's the right time for you, oh God. Some people have been waiting a long, long, long time for something to break through, for something to happen, oh God. But right now, Father God, we want you to let them understand that it's not about them. That the angels are fighting in the heavenlies, Father God, for that matter, right now. Right now, Father God. The message is on its way. It just hasn't gotten here yet. Be patient. It's coming, Father God. The breakthrough is coming. The, the, the loosening is coming, Father God. We ask you to just give us a patience to trust you more. Father God, we pray for those who are struggling in their minds, Father God. Those with anxiety and bipolar and PTSD and depression, Father God. read somewhere in scripture that you say we have a sound mind so I pray that right now Father God for them a quiet a peaceful and a sound mind Father God let them turn all of that stuff over to you oh God release it that they might Father God be able to just be at peace and rest in you there are those, Father God, who are resting, or are, 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 have lost a loved one, Father God, and they're grieving. I pray, Father, for comfort for those families. I have a friend that I've been sitting vigil in hospice with the last three days, Father God, and I ask you to be with his family. God, take him quickly. Don't let him suffer. God, we thank you for, even in the last days of our lives when we're sitting in hospice that you are there that you're with us you never leave us nor forsake us we thank you for that God be with those who are just lost who don't know where they're going Father God don't have a purpose in life don't just don't have a even sometimes a reason to wake up in the morning. But Father God, let them know that you are the reason for them to get up each and every day, Father God. That they have a purpose. You say that you have given us a purpose, Father God, for our good, not to harm us or hurt us, Father God. So I pray for them, Father God, who, who have that lost spirit today, that you will be with them, oh God. Help them, oh Lord, right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for this nation as we 
get closer to November, 5th, November 5th. Sometimes I just don't even know what to say. I've tried not to engage this year in any of the stuff that's out there, Father God. Stayed away from Facebook and stayed away from all of the, the, the anger and the hatred and the spewing of lies, Father God. I ask you to help us to turn to the truth, Father God, that you are still in charge of the government. You are the, still the head over all of them. And Father God, we trust you. We trust you. No matter what happens on November 5th, we trust you. That it is the man or the person that you want there for a specific person for this space and this time. So have your way, O oh Lord. But help us to remind us who we are, Father God, that we are to love and to be at peace and to be gracious and kind, Father God, no matter what. So, Father God, I just thank you. For this world that's full of turmoil, Father God, I ask you to just be with those who are stuck in the midst of all of that, the innocent are there father god stuck in the middle of war stuck in the middle of co political conflict father god our soldiers who are spread out throughout the world trying to keep peace father god i pray for them god just be with us you did not tell us that this world it would be an easy place to live in you told us that we would face troubles we would go through trials and tribulations, oh God. But the promise is that you would be there. And that those trials and tribulations are shaping us and maturing us into stronger and more faithful Christians. And so God, help us not to be so angry at being shaped. Melt us and mold us into those women and men of God that you want us to be. don't want to forget about caretakers this morning those who work so hard and I'm, I'm talking about hospital workers and 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 CNAs and all of those who care for those who are sick father God the caretakers in the homes family members who are caring for sick loved ones father God bless them keep them and make them strong father God so that they can continue to carry on in the midst of it father God we just love you we thank you for all that you continue to do in our lives each and every day. We pray, oh God, that you will just, like I said, settle our spirits today. Let us leave it all here. Let us not take a thing away, Father God. Let us start with a clean slate as you do every, you start us every morning with a clean slate. Let us walk away with that clean slate this morning that we might be able to worship you, that we might be able to praise you, Father God, and we might be able to trust you just a little bit more. Father, it's in the name of Jesus the Christ, I do pray. Amen. Amen. Shiloh. So I tell you, I haven't sung this song in a while. But I've had a lot of change since I sung this song. But I'll tell you, one thing that has not changed is my love 
for God. Because he is the constant and he is never changing. So y'all can sing along with us if y'all know this. I know I've been changed I know I've been changed good Lord and I I, I know I've been changed the angels in heaven done sign my name help me choir I know I've been changed Good Lord, I, I know I've been changed. Good Lord, and I, I know I've been changed. The angels in heaven sign my name. See if you don't believe I've been redeemed. I tell you the angels. I, I know I've been changed I know I've been changed Good Lord and I know I've been changed The angels in heaven sign my name Well, follow me down to that old Jordan stream, I tell you the, the angels in heaven sign my name. See, I stepped in the water, and the, 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 the water was cold. I tell you the, the angels in heaven sign my name. Said it chilled my body, but could not touch my soul. I tell you the angels in heaven sign my name because I I know I've been changed I know I've been changed good Lord and I I know I've been changed the angels in heaven done Sign my name. I, I know I've been changed. I know I've been changed. And I, I know I've been changed. The angels in heaven done. Sign my name. The angels in heaven done they done sign they done sign they done sign my name you pray with me father god for our angels that keep watch over us day and night we are grateful 
Thank you, God, for this day of worship. Thank you, God, for another chance to honor you and worship you and glorify you both in spirit and in truth. We, God, uh, we turn, God, to hear a word straight from you. Thank you, God, for looking beyond a preacher's faults that your people can share in the best good news we've ever heard. That is you, God, you love us. You love us unconditionally. You sent your son to die for us, but he did not stay dead. Got up on the third day with all power in his hand. Seated at the right hand of God even now, making intercession for us. Bless your people as you see fit. Amen. Amen. If you're glad that you've got breath in your body, if you're glad that you are alive and well, if you're glad for the blood that's flowing through your veins, come on and tell God thank you. Don't take it for granted that it's just another day, but this is the day that the Lord has made. Anybody got one reason to rejoice? Anybody got one reason to say thank you? Anybody got one reason to tell them hallelujah? And glory to your name. You got one reason whether you say it or not. I just want you to know that you do have at least one reason on Zoom and YouTube as to why you can bless God today in the name of Christ. It's not just a long day today, but it's a long week. It's homecoming Sunday. I certainly invite everyone to uh, be blessed by the particular gifts of the culinary ministry after worship. And I ask that you come back for our 2 p.m. Somebody say 2 p.m. Not 3 p.m. It's what time? 2 p.m. worship service this afternoon with Pastor Greg Greer and the uh, Massaponics uh, Baptist Church. Also, not only is it a long day, but it's a long week. But it's a good week. Revival kicks off tomorrow. Are you excited? Three different preachers each night, all are God's great voices in these days and times. And then the weekends with the church meeting on Thursday the 24th. And I hope everyone will attend all three of these, homecoming, revival, and church meeting. Is that all right? All right. Uh, Acts chapter 14, if you, this is a first time you are here, first time streaming, I want you to know that we've been uh, in the book of Acts since Easter Sunday, and we'll keep going uh, into next year. Acts chapter 14, we are pretty much at the halfway point through the book. I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible Version. Acts chapter 14, starting with verse 21, and it reads like this. After they had preached the gospel in that town, that town being Derby, and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch, strengthening the disciples by encouraging them to continue in the faith. And by telling them it is necessary to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders for them in every church and prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. They passed through Pisidia, came to Pamphylia after they had spoken the word in Perga. They went down to Italia. From there, they sailed back to Antioch. They had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. After they arrived and gathered the church together, they reported everything God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a considerable time with the disciples. You may be seated. Let's share together from this subject. I want to talk about kingdom discipleship. It's kingdom discipleship. Just to give you an occasional reminder of why we're parking in the book of Acts. Many of you have seen this slide before. Why the book of Acts? Book of Acts documents and details the purpose, faithfulness, developments 
oppositions, and success stories of the early church. They include the following church elements. Gospel, kingdom, forgiveness, confession, repentance, prayer, fasting, worship, power, filling, preaching, and teaching, and witnessing, healing, leading, discipleship, fellowship, stewardship, sacrifice, boldness, revelation, calling, discerning, gifting, and serving, mission, evangelism, miracles, deliverance, and victory. You get all of that and so much more when you read the book of Acts. Some of you have seen this about four or five times by now, and Miss Esther, you know that there's a word that's not on this list, and that word is suffering. If you notice in the early church, the book of Acts documents, narrates the early church, which in turn gives us Paul's New Testament letters as he corresponds to the churches he planted along with Barnabas. And given all the early church experienced in service to God and in the name of Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, there's one thing that they were guaranteed to do, and that was to suffer because of who they belonged to. No one knew how many disciples would be made when they preached in a certain city. Nobody knew whether or not they would die because they preached the gospel, an inclusive gospel of both Jews and Gentiles. No, nobody could predict certain elements of how the mission would go, but one thing was promised. If it wasn't easy for Christ, it won't be easy for you. Christ said, no servant is greater than their master. And if he was hated and rejected and despised for revealing the heart of God and revealing the essence of 613 Old Testament laws, then his disciples would experience the same. I know that there's a question, Norman Freeman, you've been asking since last week. I held off. I intentionally did not answer it last week, Gwen, because I know you want to know. I know I can see, I can see your minds right now. And I know there's a question you've been asking. Last week, if you recall, the Apostle Paul was dragged out of the city. He was stoned outside because some people need concealment for their behavior. And the people who stoned him thought he was dead. What did the disciples do? They surrounded him created a circle around him, and I believe they did at least three things. Somebody prayed for him. Somebody treated his wounds. And somebody helped him get back up. The Bible says after they did that, Paul and Barnabas left the next day for Derby. Only Paul was stoned but Paul and Barnabas left the next day for Derby. I can read your minds. How come Paul was the only one who was stoned? Somebody else had to be thinking that. Don't, don't, don't do that to me. Paul and Barnabas are missionary teammates. They're both reported as having something to do with the preaching that caused these mobs of people, Jews and Gentiles, to be so upset with them. Yet, Luke never bothers to record that Barnabas suffered any type of mistreatment, let alone stoning, even though Paul did. You got to remember this verse, this next slide from Acts chapter 9, verse 16. When God called and converted Paul, he told him, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Maybe Paul did the majority of the preaching, so that's why he alone 
was left for dead. I don't know why Luke doesn't mention any suffering or persecution or hardship related to Barnabas. But I do know that Paul's words in verse 22 are real. It is necessary to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. You wonder why I'm taking my time? It's because I need somebody not to be afraid of this verse this morning. I need somebody to grow up in God on Sunday, October 20th, 2024. I need somebody to reinterpret what's happening to them and why. It's not just simply that somebody doesn't like you. It's not simply because you got haters in your high school classroom. It's not simply that some people don't have a filter, so they just let anything fly. No, no, no. No, no, no. Disciples who handle it the way Christ handled it will now interpret events and a chain of events, Brooklyn, as hardship. Paul and Barnabas, better known as Pastor Paul and Bishop Barnabas, they revisit the churches they planted for the purpose of debriefing the nature of discipleship. The last time they visited Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, people were enraged and interpreted them as insurgents against the true and living God. Why? Because they preached that God loves, that God accepts, that God has made a way through the cross of Christ for both Jews and Gentiles alike. And the Jews and Gentiles who didn't like that, they started to conspire against them and poison the minds of the people. And they, they disrupted the mission, but they couldn't disrupt the message. How many know that once the message is communicated and once the story is told and once somebody understands the cross more clearly and once somebody understands the Messiah more clearly and once somebody can peek inside the empty tomb through the rhetoric of some teacher, some disciple maker, some Sunday school teacher, once someone understands what really happened and they come to trust the story, their life will never be the same. This time, Frank, Paul and Barnabas, they don't have to go to the angry mobs in the synagogues, Eunice. They don't have to do that. This time when they go and they revisit the churches they planted, they can enter into the homes of people so it's much safer and they can have conversations. Do you see what's going on? They're, they're coming back the way they came to check on the disciples they made. They don't have to go to the synagogues. They can go into their homes and have civil conversations. And when these new disciples saw that Paul and Barnabas had come back to check on them, they started asking questions that sound like this. How do I know my faith is strong enough for the kingdom of God? How many know that there are some people who like the cross, but they don't like the ways of the kingdom? They like the fact that that God has forgiven all of their sins and they believe that heaven is their home. They like that part, but they don't like what comes with living like Christ and living for Christ. They ask Paul and Barnabas these kinds of questions. But what if I get stoned for witnessing about Christ and there are no disciples to surround me and treat my wounds and Help me get back up on my feet. They started asking questions like, how do I know Christ is truly all I need? Pastor Ball, Bishop Barnabas didn't have to debate this time with the people. They could debrief instead of debate. And they, through all their debrief for these long periods of time in which they stopped through the cities in which they already made disciples, they told these new disciples and these experienced disciples, the kingdom of God is not some bed of roses. The kingdom of God is not for the faint of heart. And disciples in the kingdom of God 
must follow the life of Christ. It's fascinating that in this nation, some of everybody likes to complain and claim they're being mistreated. One writer puts it like this, strong minds suffer without complaining. Weak minds complain without suffering. Republicans claim voter registration rolls should be purged because of cheating. Democrats claim the pace of progress is too slow. Christians claim too much has changed and society has gone backwards. Scientists claim not enough is being done to address and reverse climate change. Government officials claim FEMA relief for hurricanes is going to immigrants instead. Israel claims that they know the difference between war and genocide. Russia claims that they have a right to retake Ukraine. Ukraine. Everybody's making claims <laughs> about what they're experiencing in life and the mistreatment that they're going through. But you need to know that out of all of those absurd claims that people make, you and I are the only people who can claim that our hardships are kingdom hardships. Paul and Barnabas teach me at least three things about what kingdom hardships and therefore kingdom discipleship is all about. The first thing that comes up in this passage is that kingdom, kingdom disciples endure. Kingdom disciples endure. In the book, Zeal Without Burnout, the author notes the difference between sacrifice and burnout. He says there's a difference between experiencing fatigue and acknowledging you need a break before burnout and enduring as a kingdom disciple because you live as a living sacrifice. He said, don't you ever confuse those two. And that's what Paul and Barnabas are trying to get across here. So what did they do? They strengthened the disciples by encouraging them. It's right there in verse 22. It says, and they strengthened the disciples by encouraging them. They told them to continue in the faith and remain true to your first belief. Why? Because if you don't, you run the risk of not knowing the difference between expire and endure. That's what God doesn't want you to do. God doesn't want you to expire. God wants you to endure. Jesus told him in Matthew chapter 5, don't be shocked that all this is coming. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You are blessed when they insult you. This is what Jesus is teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you are blessed when they persecute you and, and they speak false of you and every kind of evil against you because of me. And then he took it a step further. He said, you might as well be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. But if you don't think the reward is coming, you'll expire and not endure. If you don't think there's any reward, any redemptive reward down here, let alone on the other side, you, you'll say, forget this. I might as well go back to the bar. I might as well go back to the club. I might as well play cards all weekend. I might as well give this up. But God wants you to endure and not expire. Somebody needs to know that God will let the press in pressure and the hard in hardship increase your endurance and your maturity in the kingdom of God. There's a press in pressure and there's a hard in hardship and those, those won't be a waste of time. God is using them to mature you in the faith. God will let you know that not only have you come too far to turn around, but if you keep walking, you'll bump into me. And kingdom discipleship can feel just like this. Uh, you know, there's a difference between our clothes and then workout clothes. Okay, I don't ever go to the gym and see anybody dressed like they are right now. Right, when you go to the gym, they are workout clothes. And uh, I had to buy some new workout clothes not too long ago. And, and I was taught a lesson because workout clothes, Zoom and YouTube, uh, now come with these extra layers of compression. And, and when you first put them on, it's like you're about to die. And, and you're saying, I need to breathe so I can work out. 
I don't know who decided to make workout clothes this tight. I know my size. I should have gone a size up. Let me return this and make some changes before I need some oxygen at the gym. But I learned something in researching the true nature of why it has to feel so tight when you're wearing compression clothes. And it's because the tightness and the compression help the blood flow. And as long as it reaches to the highest mountain, and as long as the blood flows to the lowest valley, you go feel the compression because it's helping you to survive what you're going through. Since the blood is flowing, you might as well handle your hardships. Since the blood is flowing, you might as well keep the faith. Since the blood is flowing, you might as well turn the other cheek. Since the blood is flowing, you might as well keep praying for people who don't like you and live as a disciple of Christ. Anybody know that it's the blood knowing that it's flowing why you can keep going uh, the second thing that these two apostles did when they revisited these churches that they planted is that they had to educate them they had to educate them they they told them to endure but then they had to educate them the education included expanding their understanding and exposing them to what must follow their belief. They told them that now you're disciples and that now that you haven't turned back, let me tell you some more things you can look forward to. Okay, uh, you know it was the combination of Malcolm Gladwell's 2008 book, Outliers, The Story of Success. Anybody read that book? Outliers. And, and a combination of TED Talks that gripped people looking for solutions you know TED Talks anybody you watch TED Talks it, it, it was the combination of those two that took this country and took this world by storm because all these years later the culture has a greater appetite for success stories than suffering stories yeah people in these days and times I'm trying to help somebody disciple somebody younger than you in these days and times people don't want to hear what you got wrong they just want to hear what you got right because that thing that you got wrong that was for you that that ain't, that ain't for me whether you tell me or not I I ain't got no interest in what you got wrong I'm not trying to hear it and it has affected making disciples in the kingdom of God because there are people, when you start talking like this, say, I ain't signed up for all that. But little did you know, you did sign up for all that when you confess Christ. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a conference I go to, there's a preaching conference I go to uh, pretty much every spring. And, and this preaching conference was supposed to be the paradigm for all conferences. Somewhere around uh, the turn of the century, somewhere around uh, 2000. Uh, uh, conventions and conferences of every denomination you could think of were packed. It's just They would just take over a city. The convention center would just be packed. Well, by 2010, I told you because of TED Talks and books like Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, that was no longer the case. And, and all these conveners of these conferences and these conventions, they wanted to know why is attendance going down? And one pastor came up with a brilliant solution. He said, he said, you got preachers and church leaders of all kind in ministry, mainly those responsible for preaching and teaching on a weekly basis. They come to these conferences. Well, they don't just need to hear more preaching and teaching. So when you go to some preacher conferences, this is insider information. I know you want to know these things. When you go to some preaching conferences, all you do is hear sermons and more sermons and more sermons and then all some people do is steal sermons and steal sermons and <laughs> steal sermons and dress them up and say they didn't steal it and all that kind of stuff. This pastor said, we gonna do something different. And, and it has galvanized and helped pastors all across the country, including the world. Instead of sermons during the morning session, he has something called story time. And for the one hour, in which the preacher used to preach, this pastor of 30 or 40 or 50 years takes his or her time and just walks everybody 
through the success story of their church. And throughout that success story, they show old photos and they, they, they show what church used to be like in 1985 and 95 because there are some pastors who weren't around then, so they don't know. They just take their time during story time and help everybody see not just the highlights, but the lowlights because God can be glorified in both. Okay, uh, these new disciples that were uh, at Lystra and Iconium and uh, back in Antioch, they wanted to know the success stories. They wanted Paul and Barnabas to tell them, you got you to gotta go inside the house and you got to see these people seated around Paul and Barnabas. You got to see the look in their eyes, the intensity in their face. You've got to look because they wanted to know, how did God do it? Please tell me, how did God Make 20 disciples in that city and 35 disciples in that city and 100. They wanted to know. And curiosity doesn't always kill the cat. You need to know that the kingdom of God is filled with success stories. And if you ask the right question and you know where to look, you can find your answer. Because success stories are all around us. They, they, they ask questions like this. How have some traditional churches grown over the course of the 21st century? They ask questions like, how did some small businesses grow during a global pandemic? Some people can't add it up. They can't make sense. That some people want to know, how can some Republicans and Democrats work together to co-author and sponsor bills for the common good. Where are the success stories? And that's what Paul and Barnabas did. They strengthened their souls by telling them the success stories. I'm not sure Paul ever told them he got stoned. You need to be careful how you recall a story says a whole lot about what you think about the kingdom of God. It, it, Luke never says, and he told them that he got stoned. Because Paul said to himself, well, since I'm alive, and since I'm still breathing, and since I'm still preaching, and since I'm still going to work, and since I'm still married, and since I still got my health and strength, what's the point of retelling all the negativity? Tell me the success story yeah, yeah yeah paul said we enter the kingdom we we entered the kingdom he uses traveling terminology so we keep going he's talking about traveling so you and i keep what going he said it is necessary to go through go through go through i'm going through only to enter yeah and once i enter the kingdom I live in the kingdom and since I live in the kingdom I suffer in the kingdom and I have marks of rejection and marks of ridicule and marks of abuse and marks of agony and marks of being misunderstood and marks of being misinterpreted but the word of God declares that if you suffer with him you'll reign with him so the sufferings aren't as bad as they seem okay you, you, you know, some colleges and universities, uh, you know, Kathy, that they no longer require entrance exams. You know that? You got, you got grandkids, nieces, nephews going through this? Okay, do you know how much better my life would have been <laughs> if I didn't have to study for the ACT or the SAT? I'm jealous. I'm jealous. You mean to tell me you're just going to do away with the SAT? You know how many days my parents were on me about studying? You don't feel my pain. Do you know how many days they would not let me see my friends play video games? Nothing. Until you got the SAT. Well, your brother got this score. Well, your sister got this score. So now you got to come through and not get lower than them. Pressure, pressure, pressure 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 colleges 
are no longer requiring some colleges entrance exams but you need to know that in the kingdom of God you took your entrance exam yes you did yes you did you you might not remember it and you might not look at it as an entrance exam you took it because when you confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead you pass right then and there and all Paul and Barnabas is trying to tell you all your pastor is trying to tell you is that you can't take your entrance exam back you've entered now so you gotta keep going so God is glorified in your life anybody feel like keep going through your hardships and what you suffer in the kingdom of God need to remind somebody that success stories are necessary to educate kingdom disciples on what God is doing in these days on times. You need to know that's what next Sunday is about. That's what Vision Sunday is about. There's a pastor who has been where we are that has a success story and he's coming to impart wisdom. He's coming to share his story to those who have ears to hear what the spirit is saying to the church he's been there we're trying to go no we're going there anybody trying nothing we're going there and he's coming to strengthen us for the journey ahead this text lets me know that new school needs strengthening structure old school is that a fly <laughs> old school needs success stories but middle school includes both. You've been wondering what that vision principle is all about in the 2030 vision plan. It's, it's middle school, old school, new school, strengthening structure and success stories come together to produce what's needed to move forward. You say, Pastor, I, I don't see strengthening structure in here. Yes, you do, because Paul and Barnabas revisited the cities where they had planted churches and they traveled all the way back home to Antioch. Remember, there's two different types of Antioch, like Kansas City, one like Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri. No, they traveled back to the Antioch in Acts chapter 11. That was the first church where people were called Christians. And the Bible says they appointed elders in each church that's the strengthening structure of the church and the education is the success stories of how God did what he did that's how the text flows you got to endure you got to educate but you're gonna need some elders for kingdom discipleship uh, these people needed to know what is God gonna do with all this pressure and all this hardship I'm going through I mean I know I get a reward on the other side, but, but what is God going to do with it now? And how can my pain be productive in the kingdom of God? When? Now. I, I, some people say, I'm not trying to wait for the sweet by and by. I, I need to know what the redemptive value for being a disciple of Christ is now. And that's why they appointed elders in the church. They appointed elders... Because new believers and believers who are having a moment, can we call it that? Anybody ever had a moment in discipleship? Somebody having a moment right now. When you have a moment, you need elders to come alongside of you and say, hey, listen, you're going to make it through this. You need elders that say, hey, listen, we've been where you are. You need elders to remind you that the word of God is not slack concerning its promise and you will make it to the end of your journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Elders know how to combine experience with expectations. Elders is not an age thing. They're just talking about people who are mature in Christ. Elders say, hey, listen, we've been there. But I can't sabotage and discard the expectations of Christ. Christ told Peter, he said, hey man, uh, you know the devil has been after you. You know, the devil been asking me, Luke chapter 22, can, can I just go ahead and sift Peter one good time? He's ripe for the sifting. He, 
he's ripe. He carries a knife. He cuts off people's ears. He lies. Uh, uh, he, he has a bad temper. Let me sift Peter one good time. But anybody remember what Jesus told Peter? He said, hey, man, I prayed for you and you're going to make it till the end of the journey. Jesus encountered Peter fishing again in John chapter 21. It seemed that Peter had given up on his mission and given up on making disciples. And Jesus had to reinstate Peter and let him know, no, you ain't going back to fishing, bro. You've come too far to go back. Let me encourage you and remind you that if you just wait about 50 days until the day of Pentecost, I'm going to give you some power you ain't never had before, and you're going to make it through the end of the journey. That's what elders do. They let people know how to make it. Leaders cannot engage in false expectations, so elders have to tell people, disciples get hurt. And ain't no denying that. But elders are essential because they tell disciples the whole story. So not only will you get hurt, but you'll get healed too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not only will you fall down, but you'll get back up. Not only will you have bad days, but there are some good days too. And the songwriter put it like this. If only my good days can outweigh the bad days, then the kingdom of God makes more sense. Okay, I'm done. Uh, uh, it's like early voting in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I figured somebody would say that. <laughs> you know, Pennsylvania is that only state. You know, early voting has started. Does everybody know early voting has started? Yes. Praise be to God. Zoom and YouTube, you know early voting has started? You know, Pennsylvania is the only state that does not start counting the mail-in ballot until election day. Right now, they've got baskets of ballots just sitting over there in the corner and they can't touch them, don't matter how much they look at them, they can't touch them until November 5th because that is state law in Pennsylvania. Okay, now some people say that there's a whole lot of cheating that goes on in the state of Pennsylvania because their law is so different. There are people who say, uh-uh, I don't like Pennsylvania's laws. All them ballots sitting over there in the corner, people are adding to the ballots and taking some away and throwing them away. They don't know nothing. The ballots, according to state law, are just sitting over there in the corner. And some people from Pennsylvania start to use conspiracy theories to ask questions like this. How, how do I know if my vote counted? How do I know if the process worked? How can I know for sure my contribution was worth my effort? And when people start asking questions like that, you need to be reminded of the same thing in the kingdom of God. There is a God who is watching from above. You and I serve a God that sits high but looks low. And God knows who is and who isn't. And God knows what is and God knows what isn't. And God knows the difference between the tried and the true and people just going through the motions. Because God promised that if you go through the kingdom and if you enter the kingdom, I'll make sure you get to the other side. I'm done. Uh, I did some research not too long ago about weighted blankets. I'm thinking about getting one. Uh, because they say weighted blankets help you go to sleep better. There are clearly no success stories for weighted blankets in the choir stand. They said weighted blankets work. That's all I'm saying. They, they say weighted blankets work. And here's how weighted blankets work. They say weighted blankets act as a form of deep pressure. You're going to hear me in a minute. That can increase the amount of dopamine and serotonin, which helps you go to sleep. Don't miss it. The deep 
pressure has benefits that you can use. And the pressure from the blanket mimics what it's like to be held by somebody. Before you go eat, can I just tell somebody that there's a God who is holding you in the hollow of his hand and that God promised that God will never let you go. So no matter what you got to face when you wake up, no matter what you had to face, by the time you go to sleep, you are in God's hand. And all that pressure you feel and all that hardship you going through and all that persecution that nobody knows but you and all that suffering going on in your mind and in your body. The God of the universe, the God who created the heavens and the earth is keeping watch over your soul. What does God do? God helps us to endure. God educates us with success stories. And God appoints elders and pastors and deacons, Sunday school teachers and Christians who've been where you are, elders, to encourage you and to remind you not to throw in the towel just because it got hard. It says it is necessary. It is necessary. It is it is necessary to go through, enter the kingdom of God, and endure the hardships that all of us have. I, I, I'm slowing up here. I, I just want you to know there's a press in pressure. I don't know who needs to hear this. There's a hard in hardship that God will use for our good. It's not a waste of time, child of God. It's not, it's not a waste of time. It's not a waste of time. You're growing. You're getting stronger. When God strengthens you, as these deacons take their place, God either turns what is weak and makes it strong, or God takes what is strong and makes it stronger. Everybody is going through one of those two. God is taking our weakness and making it strong or God is taking our strong and making it what? Stronger. Here's my appeal this morning. If there's somebody who needs the strength of God, if there's somebody who feels weak in mind and weak in body and weak in spirit, you don't know if you feel like going on or not. I offer you through human hands but empowered spirits, the strength of God. The strength of God was best displayed on Calvary's cross. It looked like Jesus lost. It looked like he was weak. It looked like he was defeated. It looked like he lost. But three days later, he got out of the grave, Miss Lucille, and proved what strength really looks like. Sometimes strength looks like weakness. Sometimes strength looks like loss, but by and by, when you trust God from day to day, you see what true strength really is. First time believers, man, woman, boy, or girl, you're on Zoom or YouTube, and you want to be a kingdom disciple. Maybe you accepted Christ long ago. Maybe you got baptized when you were a child, but now you understand what the kingdom of God is all about. I invite you, my brother, it doesn't matter how young you are, my sister, doesn't matter how old you are, I invite you to put your hand in Christ's hand. Recommit your way to God. Recommit your way to the kingdom of God that will be a blessing to you now and in the days to come. Is there one person who says, I need Christ? I, I need to do it the way Christ taught. I, I didn't understand why I had to suffer and go through hardships, but now I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Because the tomb is empty. I'm going to be all right. Is there one man, woman, boy, or girl? I 
I know it can look like all these people in here looking at you and it can feel like a long walk coming from where you come from but you want to know why it's been hard and you want to know what you need to keep going my answer to you is in one person named Jesus Christ come on don't put off for tomorrow what you can do today Come on, you need to rededicate your life to Christ. You need to rededicate your way of living to the kingdom way of living. You can endure, my sister. You can endure, my brother. All of us could share success stories about what it looks like for God to pull us through. We're just here to help you on your way to heaven. Come on. Maybe this is your first time here. Maybe this is your 10th time here. Let us become, be your church. Let us become your church family today. Come on, we'll sing it one more time. First time believers, if you need a church home, if you need to rededicate your life to Christ, come on. I'm so glad. I don't know how bad your press and your pressure has been. I don't know how hard your hard and your hardship has been, but please don't go home today under any other persuasion that the God we love, serve, and worship, the Savior, the Lord and Savior, who died in our place will see you through. I don't know what it is, but God will see you through. God will see you through. Our God will see you through come on you ready to eat i know i know the smell just creeps up through the door and just listen i mentioned it last week but i need to say it again please be mindful that the culinary team has been working hard on a day like this and they have a whole process so if you need it to go plate be patient with them they'll get it to you when they can but let them do what they do because they do it so well don't they don't they give it up for the culinary team don't tell Linda Bundy I said that but they do it they do it so well don't don't tell her come on father God for this day of worship we say thank you we come asking you God to touch brother James King right now come asking you God to touch his body to touch his mind bless his daughters God and his grandchildren who are caring for him even right now thank you God that we were able to help him as far as we could knowing that your professionals and your healing hand does the rest of the work come asking you God to strengthen anybody who needs more power in their life right now anybody who needs to be reminded that your power will not fail them in their weakest moments anybody who needs to be reminded the kingdom of God is worth it and we are disciples of Christ. Bless us, God, all week long. Bless us, God, for homecoming worship this afternoon. Bless us, God, for three nights of revival. And bless us, God, for our church meeting on the 24th. We ask all these blessings and more. Because now unto you, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above, all we could ask or think by Christ Jesus, according to the power that's at work within us, in Jesus' name we pray. Glory be to his name in the church, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you downstairs and 2 p.m.